Christmas. I pray that everybody was able to be with their family and just enjoy a time of, of fellowship and get together. And I hope Santa Claus was good to you, uh, kids. I hope that you were on the nice list, not the naughty list, and woke up that morning and to see what Santa Claus brought. You know, do you ever just get a little nervous when you have to open up presents? Because you don't know what's going to really be in it. And then you've got to well, you know, wonder, man, if it's something that you don't like, how are you going to respond to this? You know, kind of ask yourself, have you ever just kind of opened the present and as you're opening, you look at it and you go, oh my, it's those jelly beans. You know, the kind that tastes like socks and, and the ones that taste like poo. And then there's some that may have a cherry flavor and some that taste like a skunk. And, and you're sitting there and you're really excited about it because you've always wanted these jelly beans. But deep down in your head, you're sitting there going, I can't believe they gave me jelly beans. And so you have to pretend though, because you don't want to just say, Oh, jelly beans? You think this is what I asked for, jelly beans? And so you're sitting there, man, you are excited. And then you, you put that to the side and you open up and you open up the next page and you're like, the Christmas sweater I've always wanted. And you put it up against, you know, and you're looking, how does this look, guys? And, and everybody's saying, oh, yeah, yeah. But then there's that one family member. It's sitting there going, <laughs> oh, he's faking big time. He really doesn't want that. Oh, yes, he does. He's, yeah, he says he does. And then you're sitting there going, you know, I love the jelly beans, especially the ones that taste like a skunk. Or I love this sweater. There's nothing like having a pretty Christmas sweater that has, you know, my face on it and the family's face on it. It says Merry Christmas from the Marantos. You know, and so, but there's always that, that cousin or that, that kinfolk that sits there and go, oh, I can spot a fake anytime. How many of us have done that? How many of us had opened up a present? It may have been during your birthday, maybe during Christmas, or even a Valentine's gift that your spouse gives you. And you're like, oh, thanks. When really you're like, what in the world were you thinking? But you have that person that can spot a fake. You know, it's kind of like that, that old man that's sitting there behind the cash register and you're paying and you handing that 20 or that 100. He's just waiting on that pen and he's just, it's a fake. You know, when you think about God and what he's capable of doing, God is capable of looking down at us and spotting a fake. He can, he can spot somebody who's just pretending. And so I, what I want you to do is to think about this. Did you take 2020, 
if you were to look back here in a couple of weeks, we're about to start 2021. And if you were to take a look back, uh, do you think that you kind of were, were you fake during that time? Was your faith more of a pretend? Because I mean, here's the thing. We so often feel like that we're able to live a life without God really knowing how we feel in our hearts. Because to be honest with you, you can trick and fool anybody around you. Oh man, I love God. Man, I've always wanted, you know, his presence to be here. I've always wanted the spirit. I've always wanted to, all this and that. But yet, deep down, nothing. And so, you know, God is one that could look at your past in 2020 and say, you know what, Derek, you just, you pretended the whole time. Man, you were fake. There wasn't anything genuine whatsoever. So what I want you to do is really take a look at your life in the last, you know, maybe in the last week or the last few months or maybe just the whole year. And would you say that your life was a pretend or, or was it genuine? Was it real? So what I want us to do is just kind of just, just take a few minutes and look at what does it look like for you to have a fake life? Just to pretend through your life because, um, um, because I kind of want to be aware of this. And so when you look at the scriptures, the first one that comes to mind is Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. And this is one in which we kind of talked about a little bit last week. But this is when you claim lordship, but your actions don't line up with it. Matthew 7, 21, that not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but those who does the will of my father. It's like saying, you know what? I'm the greatest chess player. You know, I talked, you know, last week I said that Cam and I have been playing chess now for a week now, over a week. And, uh, but if I just claim that I'm the best chess player, I'm the best dancer, or I'm the best basketball player, but I never play, or I never say, hey, let's play a game of chess. I never say, you know, hey, let's play a little bit of uh, 1v1 and all that. Then your actions don't line up to what you said. So in 2020, you may claim, I love God. I love his son. I'm so glad. But did it line up with what you are claiming? You know, I go to worship every day. I got up. We got in front of the TV and we... You know, uh, we gathered the family around and we, you know, listened to the lesson, took of the Lord's Supper. We even gave and, you know, and even before that, we somebody that made sure that you came and and you did all the proper steps. I made sure I did the books of the Bible and I memorized. But then when you went home, you just kind of kicked back again on your couch and in your recliner and didn't take anything into action. How often... Uh, have we in the past rested more than we have have pursued to godly perfection? Because we may claim that, hey, I am a follower of God or I am, you know, Lord, you may claim his lordship, but only God can really, you and God can look into your heart and say, hey, this is fake or this is real. You're pretending or man, this is, this is something that is genuine and deep and it's something that's personal to you. So I want you to make sure that when you look at 2021 and when we get closer uh, here in the next couple of weeks, that you really start talking with God and helping and asking him to help you to, to, to walk in a path in a way that is real. Because I'm telling you, we, we don't want to live a fake life, one that is a fake faith. Because you can't hide it, and God's going to be able to see it. So I think one is, you know, your fake is if you claim lordship, but your actions don't line up with it. Another one is what I call when you produce those Hollywood tears. You know, it's these fake emotions. You know, those people that are able just to cry just immediately. I, I'm going to be honest with you. Now, now. Uh, I can cry over a good movie. I can cry over a song. I, if I'm by myself in a car traveling and I hear a certain song, uh, if you put Vince Gill, go rest out on that mountain, I'm crying. I'm bawling like a baby. But then there's some people who can just 
just cry like that, but not have any heart to it. It's fake. In James chapter 2, I want you to listen to verse 15, 16, and 17. If a brother is a sister, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, I depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. See, to me, there's this connection of really feeling that empathy of putting yourself into somebody's shoes and, and wanting to help them. Then there are some who just like, hey, look, man, I hope, I, mean, I hope today is a better day for you. Go in peace. You know, oh man, you're hungry, you're starving, you're naked, you need clothes. I hope you find somebody that could. Matter of fact, I'm going to pray about it that you find something. And then here, we learn here from James is, listen, are you somebody that just says, hey, good luck into this world? I'm praying for you. Or are you somebody that is literally praying and also doing to help them? Sometimes, so often, we, uh, we pretend that we really care about somebody's life. And I am praying and I'm hoping that for 2021 that there's no more of that. That we do what we can to line up our actions with what we proclaim. And that action is, I'm just not going to send somebody out. I'm going to first see what I can do to help that person. It may be financial. It may not be financial. You may not be at a state right now where you can help somebody financially, but maybe you can help somebody by holding their hand. Maybe you can help somebody by just praying with them. Maybe you, can, maybe you have a little bit and you can go and get some groceries for somebody. Why? Because you truly hurt and you're truly in pain when somebody is in need. And so... If you're somebody who's good at just producing those Hollywood tears of pretending like that, that you really care about somebody, just make sure that you're not hiding that from God. God can see it. Everybody else may think that, oh man, that person really cares, but only you and God really knows if you do. The next one is, I like to put is, when you are intellectually imprisoned. You know, faith to this individual is somebody who's just studying and memorizing, and as great as that is, uh, there's no shock that's been put into their life. It is literally just, I'm going to sit all day, and I'm going to do everything I can just to memorize everything I see in the scriptures, but not allowing it to shock the deep part of your spirit. You know, it's one thing, I've heard somebody put it like this, you know, it's one thing to see the Sistine Chapel uh, or, or, or to read about the Sistine Chapel, but it's another thing to actually go into it look and to see it. It's the same way here. It's one thing to just to read about all the great things that Christ has done for us and how God's love is shown through here, through his son and through what he did for us. It's one thing to read this and it's another thing to live out what Christ did. Sometimes we get so intellectually in prison of wanting to know and memorize and, 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 and ready to give, and it's his scripture, ready to give a defense for what you believe. But it, it's one of these things where we just want to make sure we get you know, everything so perfectly memorized that we don't sit it back and let it just resonate and shock our soul to where then we take that thing into action. So in John chapter 5, I think this is sometimes some things that happen uh, to us. In John chapter 5, starting in verse 39, it says, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are, are they which testify of me. But you're not willing to come to me that you may have life. And I think sometimes... You know, the Jews may have gone and looked through the Torah and the old law and stuff like that and look at what was written. And I think sometimes we take what the law is now, the new law, and we read it and we read it and we forget that this points to Jesus. And I think sometimes 
we we have trouble seeing Christ through the scriptures because maybe you're 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 wanting something else more than Jesus and and I'm telling you that is what we need. And so uh when you look at this and and you look at how Christ did his ministry you know, you don't really see Christ carrying around a chalkboard very often. You don't see him a dry erase board very often. You don't know. Even when you look through the Gospels, everything was about that individual person helping themselves or more part of helping others. And so Christ found himself so often on his knees washing feet, being a servant. And so I think there's a great balance in this that you know, there has to be this intellectual imprisonment in that, hey, I, I want to study and know who he is. And then there is that part of, I want to live like he did. I want to serve others. And I think if we are honest with ourselves, if we take a look back at 2020, some of us, maybe people who just, you know what, maybe you just found daily devotionals and you just read daily devotionals to help you feel good, but you never you never took it, you never lived it. Some of you have taken reading through the Bible, which is great, and, and you've taken all these notes, but have you taken that and lived it? You know, I wonder if we were to take the hours that we take in studying, is it equal to that of which of what we're doing and serving others? And so... Um, I don't want us to pretend in that. Don't, you know, just be real and, and have this, this, this lifestyle of not just studying to show thyself as approved, but also doing that, but also living it out. The last two I want us to, you know, if you're, to, to keep us from having that fake faith of, of pretending, um, claiming lordship but maybe you're holding a grudge. Maybe there are some things that happened in 2020 where some people have done some things to you. Maybe they've sinned against you. Maybe there's some things that need to be forgiven, but you're living a life of, of man, you're extremely active, you're giving, you're, you're, you're active in church, you're doing all this and that, but you just won't forgive somebody. Uh, then I'm gonna tell you, that that is what, what I would call fake. And, and the passage that just, resonates it just stands out in my mind comes from Luke chapter 23 and this is the scene of the the cross and when you read everything that you find in chapter 23 you find out everything that happened to God's son from, from those who had deserted him, from those who have persecuted him, from those who have uh, uh, ridiculed him, who've spat on him. Uh, you, you read in, in chapter 22 and 23, uh, the things of, of the whippings and the beatings. And I just, there's so many things out there that can draw the attention of how detailed the crucifixion was. And as he's hanging there, says in verse 32, there are also two other criminals led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals on uh, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And then Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lines. If you have trouble forgiving somebody in the past, why? Because I, I'm so thankful that God extended that type of forgiveness to me, but who am I not to extend that forgiveness to somebody else? So if you walk around claiming to be a Christian, claiming to be a follower of God, and thinking that everybody around is fooled by it, God is not. If you cannot forgive your brother, if you cannot forgive the person sinned against you, God can see it. You can't hide it from him. And the last one uh, is found in James chapter two. Somebody who is fake is somebody who just says, you know what, I just believe. I mean, I, I believe in him. Now there's not, there's not much more other than I believe in him and I believe in his son. Uh, but you know what, there, there's nothing else to it. I just kind of live my life the way that I live. And I know that God and his grace and his mercy and 
all this and you know, I'm, I'm going to continue down my path, my life. I'm going to go to work all the time. I'm going to go do all the hunting I want to do and all the fishing I'm going to do and all the sports I want to do. And I'm going to do all the leisure activities I want to do. But as long as I still believe in God. And this is what James chapter 2 says about this. You believe that there is one God? You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you not, but do you want to know, oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? So I just really wanted to take this time of, of here we are in the next two weeks, we're fixing to just, you know, we're fixing to move into a brand new year. And it's a year that we're all kind of longing for. It's kind of, we can't wait for it. 2021, everything's going to be better. Um, I don't know what 2021 is going to be like. I don't know what God has planned for it. Um, but this is what I do know. I know that I want to go into 2021 making sure that I am as real as possible with God about my faith. I don't want to be fake. I want to make sure my actions line up to, to, to what I'm saying. I want to make sure that I take his word and I'm studying in it, but I'm living it out. I don't want to be somebody that just says, you know what, I'll, I, I just want to believe. No, I want to be somebody that says, I want to believe, and I want to be part of God's plan, and I want to shine the light on Jesus, and I want people to see him and what he did. I want people to be resurrected and through this baptism so they can start a new life. I want them to receive the Spirit of God. I want to help those who are hungry, and I want to feed those uh, 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 who are hungry. I want to close those who are naked. I want to just help as many people as possible in 2021. That's what I want to do. I'm asking you, is that what you want to do? Or do you want to continue down a path of just pretending like you were a Christian? I pray and hope that, man, when we're looking at this, that we just, we know that we cannot fake God, that we cannot pretend that he knows what's in your hearts. So when you lay down at night, you better know that. You better know that what you did that day, you may claim to be a Christian, but man, God knows where your actions and where your heart really is. So just make sure all that is lined up. Make sure all that is right. And so that is our prayer. We're praying for you. If you need help, if you need us to pray for you, just need to come talk uh, uh, to you. If you just need to talk to us and let us listen, man, we're, we're here for you. Get in touch with us and, um, and we'll be glad to reach out and help you. I hope everybody has a wonderful uh, New Year's. I hope you had a great Christmas. I can't wait to hear about kids, everything that you got. And so make sure that you come and when you see me, tell me what you got. I want to know what Santa brought. And so uh, looking forward to seeing you again. Good morning again, Christian Chapel. I'm joined Derek and hoping everyone had a good Christmas holiday. Got the present under the tree that they was wishing for. Uh, I know Becky and I, we kind of treated ourselves with our own Christmas present. We went to Nashville this past weekend. To Becky had always wanted to stay at the Opry Hotel and see the Christmas lights. And uh, we went to the Grand Ole Opry, so we killed two birds with one stone and enjoyed the time away. So I hope everyone else uh, had a good Christmas also. Thinking of gifts, this is the time of year that everyone... Uh, receives and gives gifts and so forth. And I got to thinking, you know, what makes a good gift great? Uh, I got to thinking about that, and there's really about four markers that make a good gift great. And the first one is, you know, that gift has to be thought out. It has to be uh, planned and, and, and thought out. And the second marker was, uh, you know, did it uh, meet the specific need of the person that you've given it to? You know, the desire, did it have an impact in, on that person? And then, of course, there's a sacrifice involved. Was there a sacrifice involved uh, in, in giving that gift? And finally, you know, what's the long-term effect uh, in, in the gift that you gave? I got to thinking about that. And, you know, it doesn't have to be a big gift to have those four uh, box checked. I, I've received larger gifts, in, in, you know, when I was growing up. But the one that, that I thought of most of all was... And the Carpenter boys, they always got a shotgun when they turned of age to uh, go hunting and so forth and started out with a single barrel shotgun. And uh, as you got older, 12, 13 years old, daddy would buy us an automatic. 
I know EC was the first one. They went to Western Idaho, and he got a Remington 1100. A couple of years later, Etzel, uh, my middle brother, went, uh, Daddy, they went to J.J. Rogers in Nelton, and he got a Browning 12-gauge shotgun. So I was really anticipating this is that thought-out purpose uh, of a gift of, of getting a shotgun when I turned 12, 13 years old. And sure enough, on my birthday in June, uh, Daddy come in one day with a Browning Sweet 16 uh, Belgium-made automatic shotgun. It was used, it, it had some scratches on it, but I was proud to death of that shotgun. And I checked that box, it had been planned out because I've been looking for it for a long time. And as far as meeting, you know, did it meet the demand, the desire that I had, I couldn't wait till Labor Day and, and go into uh, Dick Wax's uh, dove field and shooting doves. Uh, I always had that little 20 gauge single barrel and couldn't shoot too many, but this time I could shoot three times and miss all three times instead of just once, you know. Probably shot a half a case of shells and only killed a half a dozen birds, but I really enjoyed that gun. It, it, it met the need, it had the desired impact. Uh, loved that gun. Killed more squirrels and probably doves, a uh, few ducks, a few deer, probably raccoons and crows and blackbirds, but uh, it, it met the desired, uh, it had the desired impact of, of a perfect gift. Uh, and it come out of sacrifice. You know, back in 1967, the minimum wage was, I think, $1.60, $1.40. Uh, Daddy worked at Monroe Trousers, probably didn't bring home over uh, 70 $80 after taxes and income. Uh, in, in uh, insurance and so forth. But he sacrificed to get that gun. It cost $110. He bought it from a friend in Oklahoma. And that's almost two weeks' pay. So it was a sacrifice to get the gun. So you can check that box off. And does it have long-term effect? I still got that gun today in my gun cabinet over 50 years ago. Uh, it's my Rembrandt, my Picasso. I wouldn't, I wouldn't sell that gun for a million dollars. I mean, what can you do? Just look at a million dollars, but that gun, I mean, I can hold that gun and think of memories and the things I did as a kid and growing up, and I'll probably give it to my grandkids. Uh, they won't have the same memories I have, but uh, it, I really wouldn't sell that gun. But that's what makes a good gift great is, is those things. As we gather around the table this morning, around the fellowship, and remember Christ's death, uh, this is the time of the year, of course, people... Uh, think about the gift of Christ and, and what he did uh, for the world. And if you think about that gift, you can mark off all four boxes of, of what I just talked about, uh, of making a good gift great. You know, it, it was thought out even before time, even before, uh, before the creation of the world. In 1 Peter 1, 19 and 20, it says, uh, But for the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish and without spot, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. So even before the world was created, God and, and Jesus uh, knew that this gift was going to be given to mankind. And then, of course, in Genesis 3, 14 and 15, it's the first mention in the Bible where he talks about uh, Christ coming and, and being uh, the Savior of the world. So it, it was thought out. I mean, it's thought out before uh, time started back in eternity before time. And did it meet a specific need? The second box that we're talking about. Yes, it, uh, Romans uh, 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So we needed that. It, 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 had, a, it had a need. In Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So uh, it, it did have a need. And, and we, we, we needed Christ to come. Uh, and, and the sacrifice. We talked about you know, all these things, the gifts of the day, uh, they're pale in comparison to the sacrifice that Christ made uh, coming and uh, coming from heaven, from that perfect place to this sinful earth and, and walking uh, along beside man, not sinning, uh, just the sacrifices he made living from day to day. Uh, and then on the cross that we're going to remember this morning where he died, the, the, the brutal and horrible death, uh, the sacrifice he made. Uh, that we might have that everlasting life. It, it did come at, at a high sacrifice. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that gave his own begotten son, he gave his son a gift uh, that who you know, believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So it, it had a need, uh, he had a sacrifice. 
And finally, uh, did it have a long-term effect? You know, do, do we think about Christ and his birth and his life and his death? And we have different times of the year that uh, the world thinks about that, but we think about it the first day of every week. And it should bring, you know, there's some sadness in it, but there's joy that, that, that we can celebrate uh, his death because we know he's no longer in the grave, that he's risen, he's back in heaven uh, and waiting for us one day. So it, it does bring joy every time that we gather around the fellowship table to remember Christ's death. And uh, at this time, we want to do that uh, by partaking of the, the loaf, which represents his body, and, and the juice that represents his blood that was shed on that cross. So if you will, pray with me, please. Now, dear Father, we do give you thanks for this day, uh, for this opportunity to gather around your fellowship table to remember your son's death on that cruel cross of Calvary. As we partake of this bread, which represents that body that, that came from heaven and came to earth and, and, and walked, but was hung on that tree uh, and died for our sins, that we might have that perfect gift, that gift of salvation that you give us because of his death. We pray that we might take this bread and we'll remember the cross and remove the other thoughts of the holiday cheer from us and, and focus on that death on that cross at this time. And take this in a manner pleasing to thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Pray with me again as we continue our thoughts. And then, Father, again, we thank you for this fruit of the vine, which to Christians around the world on this first day of the week represents the blood that was shed on that cruel cross of Calvary. It finished the perfect gift that you give us, and we're so thankful for that, and thank you for his sacrifice. Thank you for his planning, and thank you for the joy that we have knowing that we're going to be in heaven one day with you. As we take with this fruit of the vine, which represents that blood that was shed, may we do so in a manner pleasing to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. At this time, we also have the opportunity to uh, make a contribution as we've laid by in the store what we've uh, earned during the past week. We're thankful for our, our income. Uh, we just want to thank for all the physical blessings that we've had during this holiday season throughout the years. And we always want to thank God for those things. So if you would, pray with me again. And then, Father, we do give you thanks for all the physical blessings that you've given us for the means of support that we have, our, our jobs, our retirements, our income. We know that all good things come from you and help us that we might be good stewards of what you've left us with. We pray that we'll search our hearts and we've wait, laid by in store and that we'll give back, uh, knowing that we can't outgive you, that everything we give, you just multiply. And we pray that uh, we'll use these goods, that your kingdom will be expanded here in this community and in this state and throughout the world with our mission work also. We pray that you'll bless each giver. We pray that you'll uh, be with us as we give and give with a cheerful heart. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Oh.